They're just about at 9.40, so we're going to formally kick off. Thank you, everyone, for being on time, um, being here. We know that you're all running small businesses. You're serving your communities. You've got employees that you're responsible for and worried about. Many of you are architects and designers as well who are running your own practices. So um, we're really grateful that you're here to learn more and help us help you. Um, today, we've got uh, about an hour and a half. Um, we're just going to kick off getting to know each other a little bit, understand who's here in the room. I'm always really curious about who's taking the extra time to be here um, and get this extra technical assistance. Um, we'll talk a little bit about resources that are available to... Thank you. Annie runs the show. <laughs> I'm a mere prop. No, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available to uh, make a lot of these safety and ADA modifications. Um, we'll also talk about, you know, when permit applications are due. The state has just announced that their emergency order is going to be expiring in February. There are lots of questions that have ensued around that. There's also been questions about APC, so we'll, we'll take some time to do that. Um, at, there will also have a little bit of kind of an interactive quiz. Um, we're really hoping to make this uh, something that we're doing together and not just a, like, kind of a one-way, uh, you know, boring lecture kind of format. So we'll look at some of the requirements and then we'll have you guys diagnose site conditions, photos that we've taken out in the field. Um, and then we have questions and discussions. Great. So who's here today? Um, we already uh, introduced um, folks from MTA, Brian, and from the fire department, Dennis. My name is Robin. Unfortunately, our partners at Public Works couldn't be here today, so I'll be um, presenting their work. So who's in the room? I, is anybody in the room a builder or a contractor? A GC, okay, awesome. Thank you for being here. What about an architect or a designer? Okay. Um, small business owner, shopkeeper, retailer, wonderful, okay. Anyone else that didn't raise their hand? That, yes, tell us where you're from. Um, I'm a landlord. Okay, you're a building owner, a landlord. Okay, and you have, I assume, commercial tenants as well as residential tenants? Uh, just commercial. Just commercial. I'm an yes, Anaheim Harper, so I'm having a small business in Chinatown, so I want to learn more about the slope. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yes. Chinatown is very slopey. All right, so shared spaces, as we know, uh, can happen in many different parts of the outdoors and in the public realm. Um, we've seen on streets like Valencia, on Grand Street in Chinatown, um, on 37th Avenue, out in the Sunset, many other streets in San Francisco for a uh, period of days for an interval of hours during the week, um, neighborhoods are, are sponsoring these recurring pop-up street closures. Um, we've also seen shared spaces on vacant lots, surface parking lots, um, you know, pre-development sites. Of course, on the sidewalk, building on the tables and chairs program, really successful tables and chairs program that the city has had for many decades. And probably um, the most visible and most scrutinized, I call them the charismatic megafauna of the Shared Spaces program, parklets. And much of today's um, uh, sort of uh, training will focus on how to make those safe and accessible um, as we move out of the pandemic. So there um, you know, are many different applications as well. Not all shared spaces are uh, commercial. My sense is that many folks here today you know, probably operate a restaurant or a retail establishment. But as we know, for uh, about a decade before the pandemic, San Francisco um, had parklets that were serving other kinds of community uses. And those are still available to folks who want to do that. Before we get into the nitty gritty of design and um, safety criteria, um, we wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we are currently accepting applications for equity grants. Um, these are uh, $2,500 grants to um, support this work we'll talk about today, which is to um, transition shared spaces and parklets into safe and accessible sites. <coughs> so these can pay for capital costs, like tables and chairs, materials, barricades and diverters and the like. Um, so you can go to sf.gov slash shared spaces dash equity to apply for that. Mayor Breed has been um, extremely um, attentive and generous to the program in terms of um, budget allocations um, her administration has made to um, continue supporting you as small businesses transition out of the hardship of the pandemic. 
So um, the, uh, the compliance grants is shown here is that, that in the second row, that green bar there to the far left, um, later this year we will be um, uh, announcing other grant programs specifically targeted at um, supporting the arts ecosystem and um, arts, nightlife, and entertainment uh, folks um, in coming to shared spaces as well as a technical assistance for um, those roadway projects and those um, surface parking lot and vacant lot projects. So arts and culture activation grants, just a little bit of a preview. Um, these are available to folks who have a shared spaces permit, of course have the appropriate permit from the Entertainment Commission. At present, that's a Just Add Music permit. Does anyone in the room currently have a Just Add Music permit for either their parklet or Great, so can you tell us where you are, sir? Your name and where you're from? Um, here is scheduling the not private brothers to change. We're in the Fillmore on 1700 on Fairwell Street. Awesome. Um, so we want to continue and bolster um, you know, entertainment, music, performance in parklets and in our shared spaces, and that's what this, uh, the, this grant will be targeted towards. We also know that there's a lot of need out there and you know, resources are, are limited. We unfortunately don't have funding to give everybody a grant to fund everything that they need to do. So we're being very transparent about how um, grant selection is weighted. Um, we're looking at geographies that are, of course, have been hardest hit by COVID. Um, we're also looking at geographies that have traditionally, historically been uh, uh, more disadvantaged. Um, based on uh, higher densities of certain populations in those neighborhoods. We're also looking at cultural districts, legacy businesses, um, and generally um, establishments that are making below a certain threshold in, in gross receipts. So um, every neighborhood, every corridor, every supervisor district will be getting grants, um, but we are waiting the delivery of those grants in these neighborhoods that, of course, have been hardest hit by the pandemic. There are also non-shared spaces, there are also, uh, I should say, other grant opportunities and sources that are available to you and your clients as you're working through how to transition out of the pandemic and into a post-pandemic uh, parklet program. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development um, does offer these other uh, grant resources which can supplement or complement other um, assistance that you might be getting. So we want you to be aware of kind of a full suite of um, potential city-sponsored grant sources that can help you all. Okay, so um, we were requesting that all pandemic parklet operators and pandemic shared spaces operators um, who intend to continue operating the parklet after the pandemic program expires, which will be in March 2023. We're asking all of you folks to submit a permit application um, by the end of this month. Um, plenty have been coming in. We want to give folks a little bit more time. So legislative permit applications are now due at the latest on January 15th. Um, we wanted to give a little bit more room in and around the holidays because we know you are all busy. Contractors are busy. However, we still highly encourage you to submit a permit application as soon as possible. Please do not wait to January 15th if you, if you can help it. Um, the faster you submit something to the city, the more quickly we can look at it, get you feedback, and ensure that you um, can have a, a permit to operate in a compliant manner when the pandemic program expires and the legislative program begins in April 2023. Some of you might also have been receiving what's called a compliance advisory. This is coming in via email. What this is, is just a list of all of the items that city staff over the last couple years, departments, and maybe even your neighbors, have noted could possibly be um, at issue at your site. Things that need to be corrected in order to achieve safety and accessibility. Some uh, restaurant owners are going to get a list that's pretty long. Some folks are going to get one that's really short. This is not a notice. This is not a, a notice of a fine or a notice of correction. This is simply a document that takes information from all of the city departments and gives it to you as a point of reference so that you can make decisions about you know, um, what to fix and when and sort of plan, um, especially financially, how to become compliant um, before the 
pandemic program ends in March 2023. So these have been going out, not all of them have been issued yet. Um, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of you parklet operators out there. So we are, we're issuing them in, in uh, batches and those should be all out before the end of the week. Hey Robin. Yes, Lori. The SFMTA assessment, when is that going to go out? So the SFMTA assessment has um, already gone out. Really? Yes. And these compliance advisories also include the SFMTA assessment. So Lori, I actually have yours. So it's, it's part of the other one as well, because that was a new to me. Okay, yeah. so people will get them with this compliance. Right? They might come in two separate emails, but this one will have Perfect. MTAs. Okay. Um, Thank you. Conditions in there. We'll talk a little bit about what MTA might say, and kind of Brian's going to talk, talk through a little bit of the considerations that they have around location and place. And then, if somebody hasn't gotten that, is there a way that they can ask for a resend of it if it went to junk or something like that? Absolutely. At the end of this presentation, there'll be an email address, and you can always use that email address to ask for any additional information. I have a question. Cool. So I, I got that um, the previous notice. And it scared me. So, so that's kind of why I'm here also. Um, yeah. Maybe you guys can help me later on see what I may need to do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being here. We're, we're definitely here to help you talk through uh, your notice. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, let's try and get through the rest of the presentation. I know questions will come up. Let's wait till before the quiz and until the end of the presentation to, um, to ask more questions. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the manual has all of the information that we're going to talk about today in this presentation. The things that Dennis and Brian are both going to talk about are all in this document. It's just been updated with more photos and annotations to try and make it easier to read than ever before. So if you haven't already, please avail yourselves sf.gov slash shared dash spaces dash manual. Okay, so, um, you know, what does it mean to move from this kind of crazy pandemic time of a Parklet program into a post-pandemic Parklet program? Really, it just makes, it means making sure that all of our sites are safe and accessible. During the pandemic, um, a lot of Parklets went up, you know, very quickly, perhaps hastily, um, because the objective was to get people outside and, and to have them uh, be dining, you know, out of doors. So um, many of the kind of safety rules and accessibility requirements that had existed before the pandemic in a way were suspended because we were in an emergency. Um, we need to move back and transition everyone to uh, conditions that of course are accessible to people who are using wheelchairs, that allow um, fire department and paramedics to, to operate and do their jobs um, as we saw in that um, little PSA. That so I'm going to step aside, um, and um, Brian is going to um, talk about requirements for sort of um, location, and um, then I think we'll pass it over to me, and then over to Dennis. Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, I'm Brian with SMTA, and um, what we do is we manage our streets and curbs, and so um, we um, I oversee a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of the permitting, so what we do is we look at your footprint and your location. Part of that location is um, understanding the curb use. So here you see um, some sh screenshots from our curb management strategy. Um, on the far side are the different curb functions, so we need it to, to do all these different things. Um, sometimes movement, um, so like a bike lane, or a transit only lane, or a peak hour transit lane. It's used for parking, um, and especially in commercial corridors, we're using it for um, pick up and drop off, bus stops, um, and um, loading and delivery. Um, and so each land use is shown in the matrix. Um, that's how we prioritize. So what works in a low density residential area um, isn't gonna work downtown. So this is how we prioritize the curve uh, when we're looking at a corridor. Um, so like in a commercial area, often loading and pick up and drop off are higher priorities than say um, curbside parking. Um, 
And then um, for the legislative program, we've been notifying car clips that may need to be modified um, for other curb uses. So the highest priority earlier on was transit boarding zones. As Robin said, during the emergency phase of this program, you know, a lot of transit was suspended. As transit comes back online, um, those businesses have been notified. Um, we also need to daylight intersections. That's where we paint the curb red to improve visibility and safety. And then different types of loading zones. Um, we either work to move them or um, sometimes modifying park lists as needed so that loading can continue as we return to um, more no normal levels of, of business. Um, and those notices have gone out. So if you're curious, um, you can email SMTA to get more info. Um, so a key piece is the visibility at intersections, and the legislation um, set this as a priority, especially on the high injury network. So this is also something we've been proactive about. Um, and for the, the legislative program, um, it's in the design manual, but there's two parts of an intersection. There's the near side where a, a vehicle is approaching the intersection, and that's where we need a 20-foot setback. And that's so that someone driving a vehicle can see if there's pedestrians or other conflicts. On the far side of the intersection where you're exiting, a driver is exiting, it only needs to be eight feet because visibility um, is less of an issue. And yeah, you can see that in the pictures. Um, and sometimes the curb isn't painted red. We are also working to paint some of those curbs red to make it easier. Um, So we are also looking at your footprint. So, and this is also from the um, the manual. But um, in, during the pandemic, sometimes people were who had really large frontages, for example, had more than two spaces. For the permanent program, we're looking at a two space cap. Um, and what this diagram also shows is that you need a three foot setback on each end of the um, parklet and where two neighbors have a parklet, they each need a three-foot setback between them. Um, and part of that is if one business decides to leave or get rid of their parklet, um, there's still a three-foot gap for each, each business. Um, uh, one thing to know for metered spaces is there should be painted lines. So that should be a reference point, is the T's that are painted, they're shown in the drawing here or if it's parallel, or um, sorry, perpendicular or diagonal parking, it's the lines. Um, so it's not the meter head. Um, if it's unmetered parking, it's, it's different, obviously. Um, and there are some times when your buffer, that three foot emergency setback, can overlap a red zone. Um, you need to get permission to do that though, so don't just assume you can. Um, mostly if it's inactive, so if there's a fire hydrant there, you need to leave the space. If it's a bus zone, you need to leave that space, but if you, if you have questions, you can email us or ask me. Um, so this next picture, for example, is in a red zone, so their three-foot access buffer is in the red curve. Um, but what this shows, um, you need to have visibility, so there is some reflective tape at the edge. For nighttime, you need to mark that three-foot zone with, um, I call them soft tip posts, also flexible delineator posts, um, and then also the, um, the wheel stop. Um, and then, um, there's also signage um, that's provided by us once your project is deemed compliant. And I'll pass it over to Robin. Or if I guess he's uh, yeah. yeah. All right, I'm Kevin from the High San Francisco Fire Department. So we'll talk about the setbacks. Um, when you have a structure, typically uh, 20 feet is what's permitted. Some properties may get 40, depending on you know, their, their uh, permit. What we're asking is that at the end of your parklets, you account for a three-foot setback. So if, for example, you get
get a 20 foot structure. Uh, 14 feet would be your working space, three feet on each side. Now, if you have a property or a park place that's at the end, and we talked about daylighting, you don't have to worry about that on the daylighting side. So if you had a structure and you're one of the ones at the end of the block and you are affected by the daylighting, either the 20 feet or the three feet, uh, or sorry, eight feet, you know, depending on where you are on the block, that end of your parklet doesn't have to worry about the daylight, or I'm sorry, about the setback, because that gives us access. We either have the, the 20 feet or the eight feet. So just keep that in mind um, regarding the, the setback. Great, thank you, Captain. And then uh, Captain Sai will come back for some, some other uh, fire and paramedic specific uh, measures. Um, oh, okay. Is it, is it time for a beer? <laughs> no, the alarm is for. Uh, who's ready? Raise your hand. No, I'm just um, okay, great. So um, again, all of this material is in the in the Parkway Manual, right? These are some of the, the main issues that I think over the last two years um, we've noticed out in the streets um, at Parklets um, that again make them currently mostly inaccessible or, or not as safe. So we'll dive, deep dive into some of these a little bit. Accessibility, of course, is a huge um, priority and issue for San Francisco. Um, equity and accessibility is something that we do, we've done really well for many years with our parklets and with sidewalk dining. Now that we have many more, we gotta make sure we stay on top of this. So one requirement um, that the board um, uh, legislated um, recently as they decided to make this program permanent was a preference, a strong preference for at least eight feet, if not six feet, of clear area on the sidewalk for passers-by. Right? So imagine two folks with a wheelchair, two folks in wheelchairs trying to pass each other on the sidewalk, or maybe there's a, you know, a parent with a, with a stroller and somebody, um, an elderly person with a walker. Um, you can see in this example, um, I'm not going to name the neighborhood or the establishment. <coughs> oh, that's you guys. Okay. Well, we have that table where those people are sitting. Okay, great. Well, yeah. So they've corrected this, right? And what's really important is that a lot of times these are really easy issues to fix. It's just about where your movable furnishings are. Okay. This is another example um, where you see that, like, you know, we're we're trying to create a clear area. Um, our um, office of disability and our ADA coordinator does not like this because there's a street pole in the way. So it isn't effectively a way for someone or a couple people, say, in a wheelchair or mobility assisted to move safely around. So again, this does not involve uh, a capital upgrade. This just involves really um, uh, moving around existing movable furnishings and objects that you're deploying or that your client is deploying. Here's another example of what it looks like to have at least six feet clear at all times. No busing carts, you know, um, no tables, no chairs, no A-frames. Completely clear part of the public realm. Um, one thing that's missing from this particular drawing, or this particular uh, photo rather, are, are diverters at either end of those grouping of tables. Mm -hmm. Those uh, diverters, um, you know, help folks who are um, visually impaired detect um, as they're walking down the sidewalk that there is a dining area up ahead. Folks have also asked a lot about platforms, and many parklets do have platforms. Folks elect to build platforms. You technically don't need a platform to have a, a curbside shared space. But you just need to um, ensure that there is a, a dining facility, an equivalent facility, out of doors um, that someone in a wheelchair can access. So a couple examples, you know, here's a really Great example of what a, a, a threshold um, looks like. Um, that's level with the sidewalk, a compliant deck, and then um, example of on the sidewalk, a, an ADA accessible facility. So I'm gonna pause there and um, invite Captain Sai to come up to the podium and just talk through um, in more detail some of these safety and emergency measures. So what we're looking at here is our two foot wide emergency access gap. So um, every 20 feet of your structure needs to have a three foot access gap for us to get equipment, medical, gurneys through, anything for an emergency. Uh, so 
this is separate from the setback thing I talked about. So you figure if you have one shared space cluster that's permitted for 20 feet, you don't really have to worry about this. This is if you are over 20 feet. If you are over 20 feet, you need a 20 foot, I'm sorry, a three foot access clear to the sky. So no cables above, no roof, um, no tables, chairs, nothing stored in the path of that. Um, if, when you do your measurements and you run into a unique situation where there may be like a parking meter, uh, a bike parking post, something that may be in the way of that three foot access, in those unique circumstances, you can shift it a little in either direction. Because the point of the access is for us to have clear access through in case of an emergency. Um, so again, it, it's really just three feet, every, every 20 feet, but if there's something, when you look at it, and there's something blocking that, that pathway, just shift it over a little to the left or right, depending. Um, but that would be the only circumstance you'd probably be able to adjust that. Pay okay, close attention to the trees, tree branches, stuff like that. Some, some of that stuff people kind of overlook. They kind of look through it and they don't look up. Uh, a lot of times our ladders are a lot taller than the roof line. And so when we're bringing it through, tree branches are gonna you know, affect that, delay it and everything. Um, so account for that when you decide on how you wanna design and construct the structures. Uh, the other thing you'll see on the, in the bottom there is like barriers, right? So if you put those barriers in, they just have to be beams like that. Uh, minimum, the lowest one will be 18 inches uh, to 27. Um, and you stack above that. Uh, change, you don't want to. What are those barriers required? Are those necessary? Is it too late for? If you're going to barricade it, um, if, gonna barricade if you're going to. You don't really have to. I think it's a, a requirement. It's part of the ADA because what I think they're afraid of or we're trying to prevent are, are people that are maybe sight impaired um, mistaking that for a doorway. And a lot of times since it's a, a three foot gap that opens out, we don't want them walking into the street. And so that's the, the main reason for that. Uh, but we need it just real simple so that we just, you know, you have a beam supported like that. We just, when we have to get through, we just lift it up and run through. Um, other kind of gates, chains, all that stuff, that, that's not going to work because um, it just it just obstructs it and slows down our access. We've got another better example of that coming up, so we can look at some examples of, of how that looks. So this is an example of why the three-foot gap is kind of important to the sky. Um, we get questions a lot as to why we can't have uh, wires or roofs, and this is why a lot of our ladders vertical like this and um, it, it, without the clear access to the sky it just, it just slows down our response and you know, um, it makes a difference on the access. Um, this is another example of the three foot access gaps um, as you can see. Uh, some of these structures are extremely long and the problem is that we've seen um, mostly are for example medical. When we have an ambulance that pulls up and you have a structure that's this long, you can imagine um, an ambulance pulling up here, getting the gurney out, having to go all the way around, treat a patient, and if they have to get more equipment, they have to walk all the way around and come back. And so that's why the three foot access every 20 feet is key. It gives us access to go in and out um, for medical or fire emergencies or anything else that we have to access to, to go back and forth. Um, and these are just examples of Things we've seen, um, lights kind of obstructing the roof line, stuff being stored, tables, chairs, etc. These are things we ask if you could be mindful to keep that path clear 24 hours a day, even when the business is closed, if you could be mindful to just keep it clear so in case there's an emergency, there's nothing that kind of obstructs or slows down our access. Cables. So a lot of places um, have lights. So 10 feet above sidewalk is your minimum height for your rated electric outlet. And then from there, uh, you can have lights on either or both just ends of your parkway. 
So from the building to the corner, no more zigzagging across, no more solid posts, nothing. Uh, cable ramps are now not permitted. So if you want lights, it's just gonna be from corners to the building. And the lights have to be quick disconnect plugs so that if there is an emergency and we have to throw a ladder, we can just pull the cords down and unplug them and then have just clear access. What we're seeing now are, are cables wrapped around poles, trees, uh, hard lines right into the building. And we have to get like a hook to pull it down and we have to get somebody to cut it and it, it just slows everything down. So that's why now we're asking for just quick disconnect plugs so that we can just unplug them. Um, I'm not sure if it's in the manual, but the minimum height is 10 feet for the outlet. 10 feet off the ground is where you wanna get that installed. You probably have to get the contractor and get a permit for all that too. The height of the wall is 42 inches maximum. Um, and that's gonna be measured from inside the parkway. So when you're standing inside on your hard deck, measure from that where, the, where your customers are gonna stand. 42 inches above that would be your, your, your tallest point in your wall. If you wanna put windows, do not use corrugated plastic. That material tends to warp and change color after a while and it screws up our visibility. If you decide you want to put windows or anything, you're going to have to use like glass or uh, plexi or some kind of material that's going to maintain uh, transparency through the, the life of your, your structure. If, uh, and I know this happens to a lot of you, if there's vandalism and stuff and you clean, eventually that material is going to turn white and, and th then th this is where you're going to have to consider replacing it because we, just, we need visibility. So nothing above 42. Uh, this is what we're talking about for the, um, the access gap. So this again talks about the... Is there a minimum? It's 42 inch... Uh, the wall. The, yeah. the wall is, is 42. Uh, no, no. Uh, 42 inches is universal building code for railing. So a lot of these dimensions are not things that we just made up. They actually already exist in other standards. So. Um, for example, if you have a railing around a balcony or something like that, or you know, on the second floor landing in your house, right? A banister is at 42. So, so it's always 42. You can have like a 20 inch railing. Um, it's gotta be shorter around much of that. Yes, I think 36. So let's get back to you on that one. I think the um, the important thing to know is that going above 42 poses a um, a safety concern. So, but thank you for that question. We'll we'll we'll. Uh, figure that out. So 42 would be your maximum. Um, three foot wide emergency access gaps, that's what we talked about earlier, and then the barriers, and then uh, like I said, the minimum, the, the bottom post here, if you're gonna put one of these on, just measure from the deck to this bottom, 18 minimum, 27 would be your highest. If you're gonna put multiple posts, that's fine, but what we wanna avoid is somebody putting like 10 of these and basically creating a wall. So that kind of defeats the purpose. So, I mean, but if you're gonna put three or four, it's, it's not gonna be a big deal. Uh, we just ask that it be easily removed by the brackets. So an address is gonna be required. Um, contrasting colors make it really clear for us to be able to identify the location of your property or the general area so that when we get a dispatch, if there is a whole street of these structures that we can see addresses so we can kind of figure out a general area of where we, we need to go. Um, this example shows uh, chains. Chains are, are anything other than like what was demonstrated in previous slides with the beams is, is not gonna be allowed. It just slows us down. Um, obviously people get very creative. Uh, things like this I could easily see walking away. So we've seen things where uh, owners have put in, for example, eye bolts and then padlock the chains to make sure none of this is chains don't leave, but then we can't get to them. So to, to avoid all this, it's just real simple to just use beams. We can cross off and then get through. What about a gate? Uh, the gate's got to, I mean, if you're going to have a gate, it's got to be open 24 hours because it's got we got to get access. So you can have a gate going uh, I guess perpendicular if you want to cut off the structure, but not a gate blocking so us from like a door basically that would open. No, not a door either. Yeah, no door. It would just be it would be like it was demonstrated there, the beams. Heaters. Okay, so right now, today, propane heaters are permitted um, till March 31st of 2023. Um, if you decide 
you want to continue or start permits when you go permanent, you'll have to reapply for a, a propane heater permit. Uh, now what I need you guys to understand is um, there's kind of two things here. If you decide you want a roof on your structure, the first thing you need to consider is if your sidewalk is bigger or longer than 10 feet. If you have a sidewalk that's longer than 10 feet, your structure can be permitted with a roof. However, if you decide to get a roof, you cannot get a permit for a heater. Period. It's one or the other. Roof or heater. And that doesn't matter if we decide to put the heater on the sidewalk or right outside your structure. If your structure is permitted with a heat, uh, roof, we, we can't permit with the heater. So it's one or the other. Um, what about electric? Then that, yeah, we don't we don't regulate that, so that yeah we can't yeah you, you that has nothing to do with that. You would probably have to talk to electrical about wiring and stuff like that. But as far as fire, yeah, uh, electric heaters is not an issue for us. Okay. Um, You're not including uh, like on the umbrella. The operable requirement is just keep it five feet away from anything that can burn. That's, that's really just the common sense rule. So, you know, if you have a sunbrella or if you have, you know, um, sunbrella fabric that might be stretched over with tension cord or whatever, just keep the open flame five feet away from it. That's what, that's, that's all we're concerned about, so. Actually, um, we can't have the heater underneath anything. Yeah. And even if it's five feet, you can't have it under an umbrella or an awning or anything like that. So, but if your design for your structure has a roof, um, and if the design is just umbrellas, I mean, it, that that would probably, probably be like a very unique case, and we'd have to take a look and do, you know, uh, personal inspection and, and kind of figure that out. And who do we have to talk to about the electric heaters? Probably electric, yeah, because that's it, it wouldn't fall under fire jurisdiction. Is that like radiant might be allowed? Radiant heat on the, on the floor? Yeah. I I don't know. It, it, I, it's not something that we regulate with fire, okay. so. Yeah, I can't speak for that. Okay. Yeah. So um, electric heaters are obviously a probably a more viable alternative in this setting, right? In a, in a parklet setting, um, you will need to work with Department of Building Inspection on on electrical, getting an electrical, you know, rated um, receptacle on the exterior of your facade. You know, generally, if you're following manufacturer specifications for a, an electrical heating like unit you should be fine, right? Those are gonna require certain clearances as well from flammable materials, et cetera. Um, I think um, it's also just, we need to be mindful again of how you're bringing power from the building to the structure. So um, the fire department you know, explained that you know, uh, quick disconnect cords are really optimal. Rigid, things like rigid conduit, et cetera, they don't work from a safety perspective. So depending on what the power need, like the draw of your units are, how many you have deployed, you know, um, it may or may not be feasible in terms of um, how you get power from the building to, to the structure. So one big takeaway from today, I, I think we can't get into like every nitty gritty detail. If you submit, when you submit an application, that what that does is it triggers review. And then you're, you're assigned a plan checker, you're assigned somebody who works on design who can get into these nitty gritty case by case questions. So please don't be too worried at this stage about like getting everything precisely correct. If you still have questions about what's going to be right, submit something and then we can start giving you feedback. Thank you, Lieutenant Sai. So I'm going to, we, I know there's a lot of questions, but we'll never get through this if we take them all um, right now. So let's just try and hold until the, until the end. Um, so thank you for your patience. I know there's, there's a lot of material. So before the pandemic, we had one kind of park in San Francisco. What we're What's shown here is kind of a tier one. These are were generally installations that were fixed, that were in place 24-7, right? But they were also open to the public 24-7. During the pandemic, we took the parklet idea and created a, a few other kind of types of parklets that would allow for commercial activity. So that was not permitted per code before, but now it is, obviously. So these facilities differ um, principally in terms of what the program, what the use is. Um, and uh, there's this middle kind of parklet option, which is a movable commercial parklet. 
So let's say you are a business that's just started or your client is a business that's just started up in their new brick and mortar location. They don't want to go through the capital outlay of designing and building like this fixed structure, right? The maintenance, the liability, all of those things that come, um, those responsibilities that come with stewarding this piece of infrastructure. There's this other alternative. You can apply for permission to use a parking space or parking spaces, you know, on, on your, on your, uh, on your curb um, with furnishings and, and materials that are movable that can deploy just during business hours. So um, that does require everything to come off of the street and inside when you're not operating. MTA really likes this option as well, and the city really likes this option because outside of business hours, we can use that curb for commercial loading, for passenger loading, for goods movement, for all of the things that our curbs need to do. Um, with more and more parklets out on the streets, um, you know, it's getting tighter and tighter, right, to make sure that our, our curbs can function and serve, especially loading needs. So that is an option that's available, and that's reflected in the fee structure as well. Um, the more, uh, the, the, the fixed parklet, commercial parklet's gonna have a higher fee, application fee, starting next year, 2023. Fully public parklets are gonna have a lower fee, okay, than the not for profit parklets. There's also a requirement that the board passed um, to ensure that at least a portion of your parklet structure is accessible to someone who's not a patron, who's not buying a slice of pizza from your, your pizzeria or you know, um, a cup of coffee. So this is a, um, essentially a bench. Imagine some place where at least two people can sit down, a grandparent and their grandchild, maybe an elderly person and their companion. Maybe you're out there on a date you're walking through the neighborhood, you want to hang out with your, um, with your sweetheart. So um, we will be um, issuing signage. Um, the public seating portion of your parklet um, will need a sign so that everybody knows where um, that is. So more design criteria to come out about that. Drainage is also really important. We don't want anyone's sub, you know, sub sidewalk basements flooding or anyone's storefront flooding. We don't want any parklets flooding and floating away. This is a standard that's existed actually for over 10 years in San Francisco. Make sure that water can flow under your parklet structure um, along the gutter into the storm drain. Um, conditions like this are really bad. They're really bad um, for safety. They're you know, obviously really bad in terms of materiality. This leads to quicker degradation of your structure, um, and it has uh, impacts to surrounding properties as well as public property. So here's an example. This is up on Bernal of a, a, a pretty good way to handle this. You've got, um, you've got clearance from end to end along the gutter, ensuring that during storm events, you're not disrupting um, and um, that's, uh, sheet flow. Here's another good example of a parklet without a deck. Right? There's a way for a wheelchair user, a person with a walker, to get down and into um, the parklet. The other alternative is to provide a ADA accessible facility at the sidewalk level out of doors. This obviously is not going to impede drainage the way that it, it has been constructed. We'll also have a sign, we also have a signage program. Once you get your permit, we will issue you this signage and there will be specs for you know, where, where to place um, uh, the city's official signage. It will denote whether or not you have a fully public parklet or maybe you're a commercial parklet. Um, and uh, again, that public bench sign. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, applications are due January 15th. 2023. Um, there are a bunch of other sort of statutory steps, right, that happen. There's public noticing, etc. This is, again, why we're highly encouraging everyone, if you have the capacity, to submit an application as early as possible. Um, we'd like to, I would love to get everyone a cleared for a, a post-pandemic permit before the end of this calendar year. Um, but to do that, we need to see your application come in through the portal. Part of that submittal is going to include um, site photos. Everyone should have gotten a handout when they came in. It's just a checklist that helps you prepare all of the materials for your digital submittal. When you do your digital submittal for the application, you, you have one shot. Um, so right now our system isn't set up for you to submit part of the materials and then log back out and then log back in and submit others. So this worksheet is really to help 
you and your clients get all the material, all the information together so that you can sign in online. It takes less than 10 minutes to submit the, the, uh, the application if you have all of your materials ready. Part of that is gonna be photos. Um, we would like for you, if you have an existing parklet, pandemic parklet, for us to show what the most current conditions are from, from these angles. We're also going to ask for um, a site plan. This does not need to be um, produced by an architect or an engineer. It does not need to be a stamped drawing. It just needs to be something that has dimensions. It doesn't even have to be to scale. There are just some key dimensions, distances, clearances that we want to know about um, in terms of how we plan um, for your footprint to look like starting in April. So you might have a footprint that MTA's already told you is not quite where you need to be, right? That will show up in your compliance advisory. The site plan is your way of demonstrating how you are going to maybe move things or modify things to meet the safety and locational requirements. There's also been a lot of questions about neighbor consent. Before the pandemic, if you wanted a parklet, it was mandatory to get consent from your building, your property owner, if you were a tenant, and both of your neighbors to either side. This is a little bit more relaxed now. Um, so um, now you only need consent from your neighbor if the parking space you want to occupy is mostly in front of their storefront. Okay, so Brian's Pizzeria is my next door neighbor. He wants to, uh, he wants to build a parklet and uh, he wants to take up two parking spaces. Well, Brian's two parking spaces that he wants to use are actually mostly in front of his own storefront. He doesn't need my permission. I can't, I can't bar him from submitting an application. But Dennis, in Lasagneria, is maybe next door to me. He wants to take up two parking spaces. But one of those parking spaces, about 80% of it or most of it is in front of my storefront. In order for the city to grant Dennis a permit He's got to get something signed by me saying, yeah, my neighbor Dennis can use this parking space that's mostly in front of me for, for a parklet. So, so one exception to that is if it's unmetered parking, so then you would need permission if there's even a little bit in front of it. Say unmetered or metered? Un unmetered. 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 There's, there's no right. space noted. Um, with the metered, it's based on the ones that are We've also tried to just create a quick and easy form that you can submit. Before the pandemic, permission came in all forms. They came, they were notes scrawled on a napkin. Sometimes it was a letter from the landlord. This just makes it really easy. You get your neighbor to sign the thing. It's already been vetted by the city attorney. We know that if we get this from you, you're good. Right, I'm just going to pause there. It's a lot of material. We don't have too much time left. So I know there were some other questions that folks had. Did you have a question earlier? I was just about the canopy. Is it the canopy if it's and heaters? The canopy shown up there with wood and metal, but it's still an issue because it's not flammable. Captain Side? Which picture are you referring to? Uh, it was when we were talking about the space heaters. There. If, if in theory that was a metal canopy instead of wood, it would be an issue. Yeah. Uh, if you have a roof, there's no roof. It's, it's open, it's to above, but there's some metal canopy. The metal canopy above the structure. If, it would, if that imagine that was metal, so it's open to the sky above. There's no um, plastic on top. So like a trellis structure yeah. almost. Like a metal yeah. trellis. And that would that would be considered. The, we're not the, the propane heater is not going to be allowed under anything. And these structures maximum height are 10 feet. So and that's another point that I want to bring out when you're constructing these. Pay close attention to the 10 foot height limit because what we're starting to see or I've seen problems with is uh, they'll do the 10 feet and then they slope because of rain and then they go up, right? So the curb side is high, but then the, the street side is low. So they'll do the 10, some places will be 10 feet and then it goes up and they think, okay, well, I'm 10 feet. But now when I'm on the curb side, it's clearly above. So just careful of that. But if you have even a trellis, anything like that, we're talking 10 foot max. So heaters aren't gonna be allowed under that period. So that's why if you had that, uh, the operator wouldn't get a permit for a heater. Okay. You just need to maintain the seven foot clear under your space. Seven foot clear under your space. Underneath the canopy. That's right, that's, that's ADA. Yeah. yeah, you need seven yeah. foot head adherence. Yes? For the letter of intent to continue uh, with our neighbors, yep. um, I guess for me it would be uh, a 
apartment complex, a uh, big apartment complex, would I talk to the manager or who would I? Is there a ground floor tenant or operator, or is that like a residential lobby? Or Just a big residential. With small um, businesses around here. Um, are there small Are there small businesses on the ground floor? Yes. Those are who you need uh, consent from. You okay. just need consent from the ground floor tenants to okay. either side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You said, you said you needed six by six inches clear for a drainage. What if your curb's only three and a half inches tall? Yeah. So, good point. There is a lot of variability out there. This is an ideal condition. I think what Public Works is going to be looking for is that there is just 